page with Guy Cosentino. In case you hadn't noticed, I'm not Guy. He had some personal business to take care of and they asked me to step in. Stop, 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 stop. Hello, and welcome to Beyond the Front Page with Guy Cosentino. In case you didn't notice, I'm not Guy Cosentino. <laughs> he had some personal business to take care of, and I was asked to step in. My name is Bob Frame, and I'm the Director of Theater Operations here at Kew Community College. Tonight I'll be talking to Melody Brooks, Artistic Director of the New Perspective Theater Company based in New York City, who has brought up some new and exciting works to the Irene A. Bisgrove Community Theater for our entertainment. So, Melody. <laughs> Central New York and Cougar, not new to you, are they? <laughs> Tell us a little bit of your history here. So, this is my home turf. I was born and raised here and uh, really developed my interest and love of theater here as a member of the Auburn Children's Theater Company way back when, which is became the Mary Ground Theater. Um, and I was in that cohort of teenagers that helped to build the original Mary Ground Theater <laughs> in the old uh, space before it got so fancy. Um, and I was a student at Cuga Community College for a year where Dan LeBay was the then director of the theater program and he was a big influence and mentor and through Dan's uh, bringing this program here I went to London for a year that was accredited through the SUNY program uh, and came back and and did some more work and um, we were invited to take a piece the students that were working here to the Albany Student Theater Festival the SUNY wide and I met Margot Lewitin of the Women's Intro Art Center, and they had a multimedia theater arts program. So that's how I ended up moving to New York, thinking I was going to be an actor. Um, but you know, life, we plan, and life doesn't always follow suit. So I became a director and a producer instead. Which is easier sometimes than be, trying to be an actor. Well, you have all the control. It's, I started my own theater company. Um, after about 11 years in New York and realized that I had a lot more to say than I could ever say as an actor um, and the kinds of work that I wanted to do and I had an opportunity to get a great black box theater and uh, I took it and took the risk and New Perspectives was founded really because I was um, kind of amazed that living in New York City and having been in London the year before the level of diversity from all over the globe and, and uh, all kinds of cultures and yet you would still go to theater in New York City and not only did you not see a multicultural um, palette, you didn't see many women at all. Right. Um, and that's why we created New Perspectives, because our, we say that when you come to a show at New Perspectives, you'll see the diversity you see on the New York City subway, um, both on the stage and off. So that's always been our goal. 28 years later, uh, we still st stick to that goal. We're still very small and off off-Broadway company um, because we have a very particular mission and we're not interested in in sacrificing that mission, uh, which is one of dealing, uh, using theater to help the community, to support women and artists of color. Um, there's not a lot of money in that, so no. we keep doing it anyway. So you work a lot with funding and foundations and? Well, we have foundations. We're lucky to be funded by the city of New York oh, right. um, because they, they like our mission. Um, we've been lucky there, and we get a lot of um, individual donations, a little bit of foundation money. So we're very grateful to the Cultural Fund here for uh, supporting us coming up and doing the shows here because it's a rarity that we are actually fully funded to do something in, it's, you know, without having to 
scrimp and save. So right, we're very which, grateful about that. Which is very important. When you and I spoke last year, you would come up to teach with Mary Bolcott. Yes. A yes. family friend. Yeah. <clears throat> and she brought you up and you taught one of my acting classes for a couple of days and worked with them, <clears throat> varying level of actors and how to do a monologue, what acting was all about from your perspective, which is different than to what I'm teaching. Mm -hmm. Because I'm teaching it as fun, whereas you're teaching it as a profession, right. which is great. And we talked about, hey, wouldn't it be great if, and you bid on it and it I talked to the foundation, and yes, the foundation came through, Guy Cosentino, of course, with um, the funding to help yeah. do this through their cultural enrichment fund. That's very important that we're doing things like this for the community, for the college. Yes. Of what very we can important. do. So your mission, as you say, is just to become, not just, but encompassing more of a diversity. I mean, you talked yes. about London. The London theater is exciting no matter what you're seeing on stage in the audience. Right. It's a way of life. Well, we don't do anything in London. Um, our our ma main mission is to develop new work by women and writers of color. Uh, and then within that, our directors and actors are very multiracial, very diverse. You know, race is, we go beyond race. It's time we all went beyond race. There is no such thing as race. It's a false notion. Um, we're all the same race. We're all, we're all of African descent. Um, but mostly it's to say, give a platform to people who don't have a chance elsewhere. Because it's so very hard, um, you know, for years there's great gender disparity um, in, the, in the professional theater, commercially on Broadway, even in the big regional theaters, when it comes to female playwrights and directors. And it's even worse for female um, artists of color or all artists of color. I think we all know that story. Um, so we're there to say, our, our motto is, we, you know, our aim is not to exclude, but to cast a wider net. You know, I grew up in the Auburn Children's Theater, and, and I was eight years old, and the very first thing we studied was Greek theater, which says theater is about dealing with your community, talking to the community, getting feedback, it's a loop. And if you don't have the entire community involved in that conversation, then you're not doing your job as a theater artist. So that's really the principle that underpins New Perspectives, which is we gotta have everybody at the table. Because if we don't, we don't know enough about ourselves. And that's you know the purpose of theater. We do go to Bogota in um, Colombia, South America. We've been there four times. We'll be going taking the two plays we're doing here okay. down there, <coughs> their alternative theater festival, and um, we're the only English language company invited. And they really like the fact that we're bringing plays written by women, which is not a custom there. They have a lot of ensemble theaters run by women, but they don't have women just sitting down and writing plays. Huh. And so they're, they like that we come and sort of model this. And that our plays are speaking about contemporary issues of um, importance and interest to U.S. Uh, lives, right. but that they're also very universal. And it gives them a different perspective on who we are as citizens of the U.S., right? You, when you're saying those shows are diverse, I mean, are you trying to show different points of view of different personalities, or are you just like we're including in what we call colorblind casting? We do colorblind casting, but it's more than that. Okay. Um, for our Women's Work Project, for instance, we select six writers. That's what you're, these two plays that we're doing. Right. Every year, we've been doing this t since 2008, because our goal is always to get shows on their feet. And when we had our lovely Black Box Theater for 15 years, we could develop a play and fully produce it. As is much the case in New York, they tore that building down and put up luxury high-rise, right? Of course, course need another one. So we got a smaller, but it's a community space, so it's affordable, it's supported, um, but we can't do full productions there. So we thought, how can we reconfigure our, our women's work project to still get stuff on its feet? And we decided to do short plays and do bring in more, make it a lab environment. So we pick six writers, they come in February, or they're given a theme. And each month they have to do a new draft. And what's very new, unique to New Perspectives is that we have a team of directors who are with the, so there's six directors and six writers. Okay. They're not paired at the beginning. But that team gives unified feedback to the writer at each level of draft. And then in June we do table reads of all six plays and <clears> we <throat> put them in rehearsal and we produce them in August in a festival. This year there's writers already. They've been given the theme last uh, February 9th. And uh, it's Now or Never, that's our theme this year. And you can all come to New York the second week of <laughs> August and see what those plays will be. The two pieces that we're doing here, uh, the first is called Oh My Goodness uh, by Kaya and Douglas. And that was developed under our theme of Unhinged, which was 2017. And you'll remember who got elected um, in 2017. So that was our, <laughs> our, our Unhinged, theme. Unhinged, yes. And the uh, second piece, Our Lady of Broad Street, was in 2018, and that came out of the resistance is futile theme for the lab. 
So, but they go together very well. They weren't written. So it's always interesting that, that these are female writers and female directors, uh, but they're all very different. And yet you can see how they all speak to the theme that the writers were given. So our big goal here is that people understand that we're developing professional writers and high quality plays that just happen to be written by women. They're not women focused. It's not, we don't put any limitations on what they can write about okay. as long as it's ethical. Um, you know, if there's things that would be really egregiously offensive to certain members of the community, we say, no, you can't do that. You can go somewhere else and do it, but right. you can't do it here. Um, and uh, and when we we make a diverse group in that setting, and diversity is age-wise, a lot of women over 40 who never been given a chance, right? <laughs> a lot of youngsters coming out of a college program that nobody that says, oh, you know, you're too young, you're too young. And then um, ethnicity and background and you know, even where you're from geographically. So we put those together and hear all those voices. Oh, great. And your companies are all pretty much Manhattan-based? Manhattan yes. Uh, you mean the actors? Yes. 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 Or, yeah, or the outer boroughs. Brooklyn, right, yeah, yeah, New Jersey, whatever. West close Chester, enough. yeah. Oh, very interesting. Um, so the, you're, you're not noticing a big difference between what a woman would write versus what a man would write? We know that there are di gender differences. There's been studies done on this for since the 50s. Women tend to write uh, much more non-linearly. They don't feel the need to be in a linear time structure. Um, it's not always the well-made play, you know, right. uh, format. But these are facts. This leads me to our second piece of suffragists from the okay. stage, right? That we are co-founders of a of a, a grassroots initiative called 5050 in 2020, parody for women theater artists. Um, that in the late 19th and early 20th century, women playwrights were millionaires. There were a number of women who made a ton of money as playwrights, right? Huh. And then from that point till now, it's roughly been under 20% of the uh, plays on Broadway are written by women in the yeah. regional theaters. Although, factually, plays written by women at the commercial and regional theater level win more awards and make more money. Really? Yes, women are 67% of theater ticket buyers in right. the commercial <clears throat> and regional theaters, right? Um, but also one could say, because women always have to be better as people of color do, right? You gotta try three times as hard, so you know those plays that make it to Broadway are that the top of the list, right? right? But there's, there's not a, it's not about, oh, this is a women's play, right? right? We hear this around film, it's a chick flick, so people think it, only women would be interested, or you take your boyfriend with you, right, or whatever. Um, but that it is, 51% of the population that we're not hearing from. Again, it goes back to unheard voices. What do these people have to say? What do we not know about ourselves as a society because we've never bothered to include everybody in the conversation? Because I also do a lot sense. of original work and you do notice that women are secondary characters. The men are the important characters and the women are just sort of their sidekicks. Shall you mean we if say. they're written by men? If they're written by men, yes. correct. Yes. Not that I've noticed a major difference in what women do, uh, although the show that I'm doing this semester called Jill Trent, Science Sleuth, is written by a man and female, a male and female team. And the two leads are female. And they beat the men. Uh, that takes place in 1940s city. And they're beating against the Nazi, the American Nazis are trying to raise money for Hitler. Uh, and it's just very Batman-y. It's a lot of fun. It's going to be crazy. The kids are having a great time working with it. But it's just a fun script, what I like, what I try to do uh, to teach the students. I and mean, we've done some serious stuff here, too. But no, um, so the women do, as a matter of fact, another written by a woman. The woman, women were more central characters, and the men were their father, the brother, right. the sons, versus the lead. I think that that, that often happens with male uh, playwrights. I don't know, if you, you know, people say you, you, the best thing to do is write what you know. Right. Uh, and so if women are writing plays, it's the people they're interested in exploring. But it's not exclusive. Uh, women are much more generous in their adding mm -hmm. male characters to their plays than men are to women. Right. And I think we can yes. say that's a long-standing tradition mm -hmm. um, that women are much more generous about what they have to give over to get something. But we, we really don't... Um, it, it doesn't come down to that, right? We're not saying it has to have so many. It, actually, in the commercial theater, it's gotten really bad. People who are writing, they're being um, told that they can't submit plays that have more than four characters or more than six characters or, you know, because nobody wants to spend any money on producing it. We don't put those limitations. We have plays that are 
fantastical, magical realism. And we always say it's our job as the producer to make that happen. And we do these plays when we do our festival in a very minimalist style, which is the only way we can do them in our small studio space. But it's representative, and we hope our audience will imagine what it would look like when the with, with the Broadway budget. Because the point is really to get the plays on their feet. Yes. Because in New York City, new playwrights get their works read, their readings galore, and they can have a play read 20 times and never be produced. Which is different, right. Which is why I feel it's so important that I've been doing the original works and the playwrights yes. are, so, are yes. so appreciative of, I haven't seen a production yet. I mean, this play will be a world premiere. Are Again, they local, these playwrights? The playwrights, I think they're in Washington State. So do you, how do you get your plays? I, I'm listed on Dramatist Quarterly. I'm listed uh, playwrights, friends of, uh, on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, I put out a, I am having trouble finding a play on the playwrights on Facebook. And I was inundated with 70 scripts. You never asked us. We've got 54 of these short got, plays. We'll have 60 by August. Length, I, yeah. And I have a couple, from talking yeah. about what you want to do, I have a couple of female playwrights who work in the city who would, I think would fall right into mm -hmm. you, probably know them we already. We also but. develop full-length plays. We have right. a women's work full-length lab. Um, and we're going to, again, it's, you know, we don't have a big space, but we got lucky. Theater for the New City, which has been around for a very long time mm -hmm. on the Lower East Side, and they're very much a social justice and community oriented, is um, presenting us one of our new full-length plays well, good. Uh, in November, at the end of November, uh, into the, like, for the first two weeks of December. Well, that'll raise your stature, too, as yeah. people. Well, it doesn't. Get we, your name out. We, our name is out. Okay. Everyone knows New Perspectives in New York, and good. I don't say that in an in a arrogant way, because mm -hmm. we are very tiny, but our work is solid, and we've been doing it for a very long time. Uh, we have worked with hundreds of artists um, who go on, many go on to be involved elsewhere, to have careers uh, or not. Um, so it's, we don't need the theater for the new city to give us any stature. We need just to give them, they, we need them to give us the space for free, which right. is what they're doing. Which is more important yes, yes. when you're trying to put yes. it together. Uh, and it's a great, beautiful 74 seat theater. So. Oh, great. Yeah. Would you say, oh, 74 seat theater, nothing, but. <sighs> It's very important down there, and that's what you're helping to do. But it is also, some plays are better in an intimate yes. setting, right? And the last thing you want to do is, you know, book a big seat. And, and in New York, the actors' union rules dictate how many right. seats you can have and all of that, and depending on what level you're doing. <clears throat> um, but it's much better to do it in a smaller space and turn people away, which I told you here, too, is if we, had, right. if we turn people away, it's fine. Leave them wanting more. Um, then to have nobody there in a right. big space. So. Well, or even, um, in, for instance, if the shows we're doing this weekend, you had me build risers on the stage. The audience is sitting right there on the stage with mm -hmm. the actors as opposed to sitting in the great big proscenium house. Right. So if I get 50 people in that auditorium or on the stage, it's great. You get 50 people in the 450-seat auditorium, right. which is still a small theater, but it's, it's empty. Yeah. So it creates an intimacy, which is what we're going to get with these plays. It creates a closeness between the actors and the audience. We also, part of our uh, performing um, ethos is that we never pretend the audience isn't there. So that will often mean direct address. It doesn't always. Um, but by bringing the audience in up close and personal, the things are happening. We, and we work with our actors on developing these skills, is that if you're there and I'm here on the stage, I cannot block you out. I cannot pretend you're not there. Right. So I'm still doing my job as an actor and I'm still delivering, but you're the person that I'm here for. I'm not here for my fellow actors. I'm not here for myself. Otherwise, I could just have you all over to my living room and, you know. <laughs> Which some people do. Right. Which, um, and I, this is not the first time I've done the shows on stage, too. I know it's you, when you mentioned it's it. It's important for the actors to learn what that's right. like. And when you mentioned that was a possibility, that was why we you opted mean, for it, because it, right. it's better with what we do. Yeah. <laughs> and we, uh, the whole idea is making the actors and the audience comfortable together, and this is what you're used to, and yes. intimate what they're sharing with. So. And I think it's really valuable that you're doing it for your students here. Because so many actors in New York, they finish whatever program they're doing. On a proscenium and stage. On a proscenium stage. Or even worse, even in a, in a theater in the round or something. But they are so disconnected from the audience. They are taught to literally pretend the audience isn't there. And then, you know, so why are we doing this? If we don't think there's an audience there, that's who we're serving Right. But if we're blocking them out, saying, please don't disturb me while I'm up here acting. And many of them, a lot of them that work with us and successfully do that, they never want to go back. They always want to talk to the audience. But there are some that can never really quite get over the idea that they need to make eye right. contact with the audience <coughs> sometimes. 
which is taking a step beyond what I do because I'm teaching how to act and learning how the young actors are dealing with and to make this eye contact with somebody is going to throw them, potentially throw them off if they're not used but to it. Do you remember in our audition workshop, it actually strengthens the it actually work, strengthens. remember that? We'll have a chat about that. We'll have a chat. Oh, yeah, I'll be uh, wrong again. <sighs> it's not wrong. <laughs> it's, uh, we also say idea. this to our writers, right? There's no right or wrong. There is only more or less effective. Or uh, uh, what works, what doesn't work. I just wrote back to the playwrights of this and made some suggestions there. Like, oh, wow, to help flow, to help things moving. Because, again, they've never seen it before. So right. it's easy. It's, it's just an experience for them. And they just hope you don't mind if I steal your cuts. Like, please take them. That's why we're doing this together. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a team effort, as you right. said, and working that's with the directors of the playwrights. Our Correct. As well, so that it's a team working on it. And we like that. So your shows tonight. Or excuse me, or not tonight, please. Tomorrow night, we right. need to. We need. We need yeah. to. I mean, they just got into town today, and we're going to take an empty stage and turn it into the facility that they need for their shows tomorrow night, and then again for Saturday night. So they've rehearsed the shows a lot in the city. They've done it on right. MySpace. So we've got a lot of work between now and tomorrow night when we open at 7:30 to get these shows up on their feet. But I'm sure there won't be a problem. They're both pretty straightforward. You and I have done a lot of talking on what's going on right. with them. And it's just a matter of working out some of the problems. And getting some lighting. And getting Which some lighting. Which is one thing we couldn't rehearse with in New York. I've got the lighting set yeah. up. We just have to choose yeah. what you want. Yeah. So, because that's one thing we do. Ha this is a very, as you've seen, very well-equipped theater. Yes. Uh, the college the college itself, I can't complain about the, how they've supported what they can do here. Even this facility here. Yeah, it's how great. How they supported what we want to do as entertainment through the SOMA School, School of Media and the Arts. It's very important to teach the students a little bit more than 2 plus 2 is 4, and the War of 1812 ended in 1815, I think. But <laughs> I may not have been a history major. Sorry, folks. So the shows tomorrow night, we're going to be entertained. How many people are in the casts? There's three in one play and two in the other. Okay. Um, and one play, <coughs> uh, oh my goodness, is a two-character play. And the other, uh, Our Lady of Broad Street, is a three-character play. And they both have similar themes. It's why the, we put the two together and called it collateral damage. Okay. Um, and you'll hear a line at the end of the second play. Um, and they're really looking at how we cope with life's curveballs, oh. basically, and um, how one gets through that in some semblance of sanity and being able to cope. Oh, very good. Yeah. So you're not going to walk out after the play when the... No, hopefully not. <laughs> hopefully not. There's been a rash of those plays. You just walk out and just want to cut your yeah. throat. I'm like, why do people want to do those? But they yeah. do. Be, and obviously, they attract an audience because they yes. keep getting done. I and would say that the first play could be done that way, but it's not the way I see it. Um, these plays were developed originally from scratch in my theater, so I've known them from birth, if you will, right. um, or even gestation. Uh, and... It's a play that, the first play that I really, um, but the cast I wanted was not available. So, um, that play was also done at the Ensemble Studio Theater, which is a very well-known off-Broadway, off-off-Broadway company in New York. And uh, it was the only play that they took that was from a non-member playwright, K.N. Douglas. Uh, and the, their artistic director directed it himself because he liked it so much. So we create really good plays that other people want to do as well. And a little bit more about the suffrage, the Saturday night piece? So suffrage is from the sages. Um, I'm a member of the League of Professional Theater Women. Mm -hmm. And Mary Lynn Henry, who is a theater historian, um, has been working a lot to try to reclaim the stories of women in theater from the 19th and early 20th centuries. And she had an idea back in 2017, because this is now the centennial of um, the 19th Women's Amendment, movement, right. yeah, uh, to look at how theater women were involved in the suffrage movement. So we did one piece in 2017 that Mary Lynn wrote, and then I adapted that for in 2018 because we got feedback and there were other things we wanted to include, and we all continued to do a lot more research. And then this third piece is one that I've sort of mostly rewritten. There's a little bit of the introductory material. Uh, but we made some amazing discoveries that all the marches that you see pictures of or the pageants in D.C. in 1913 were directed by women theater artists, really? right? Yes. Both Female director, yeah, directed that big march in um, 20, uh, 1913, that it was the women, theater women, who took 
to the streets for the first time because you know only street walkers actually walked right. in the streets uh, in the early 19th century and um, hundreds of suffrage plays were written and used for propaganda and fundraising purposes. They were done everywhere from Broadway throughout the entire vaudeville circuit. Women's clubs locally would bring in these um, plays and uh, everybody of note was really involved if, if you think about theater women from the late 19th and early 20th century. Many of them have just been written out of the okay. story as women are always written out of stories. Um, we're also doing a, a looking at a lot of African American women right. who had a huge impact on the suffrage movement whose stories are just now beginning to be brought back into focus. But that's so what, what we like to do when we're doing that kind of historical piece or research piece is uh, really find things that the women actually said their own words. Right. So bits from their speeches or things that were said about them or quotes from the newspapers to liven it up so it's not just sort of a dry lecture. It really is a performance. This one's interactive though. You saw the quiz. I saw the quiz. And if people pay really close attention and they can answer those questions, they'll get a prize at the end. Ooh, a prize at the end. Yes. So to to close things up, just to remind you, we've got the two evenings of theater tomorrow night at 7.30. Both these are at the Cayuga Community College. Cayuga Community College, I can say that. The Irene A. Bisgrove Community Theater, both at 7.30. Friday night, or tomorrow night, is Collateral Damage, which is 2-1-X. And Saturday night at 7.30 is the Suffragettes from the Stage, is the correct yes. title. And as we said, seating is limited. If you're interested, you can call 315 294-8640 and make a reservation or you can take a chance just come to the door there will, there's no pre-sale tickets will all be available at the door and we sure hope we can entice you to be here anything else you want to add to here Mel no um, I just think it's uh, I'm happy to be here happy to show to bring back to this community um, work that began in my career really began here so and I knew Sue Ryford way back when, and, yes. I, and Dan, Dan is going to actually coming to the show. Yes, he, he did call he for would. reservation, so yeah. we'll be seeing Dan LeBay. I haven't told Thames yet. Well, I told him on Facebook, there so you go. he claims he's coming. So <laughs> We'll wait and see. Yeah. If you see, is, is this going to be on just the college, or is this on a local? This is on, I'm not even sure what channels it's on. This is on the Verizon. This is on public service, public access. It's also on the YouTube channel for the college. Okay. So that being said, I would just like to say... Thank you for listening, and we hope you come to see our shows. That wasn't too painful. Not painful. Not painful.